So the first Dhamma talk is in English. Just talk a little bit about uh, the katina, what a katina is. Firstly, just want to welcome all of our guests. I have Ajahn Maha Arisak, Ajahn Dui, Ajahn Den, Ajahn Bum, Ajahn Katanyu. These monks are monks who are very close in Pansa to me, good friends. And uh, I'm very grateful that they've come, show their support. So I want to talk a little bit about dependent co-arising conditions that uh, give rise to phenomena. First up, just talking about what conditions have to be present for us to have come to listen to this Dhamma talk in this monastery. So first of all, everybody needs to have a certain amount of faith, quality of faith. Otherwise you wouldn't make the effort. Some people have traveled a great distance, many hours. Guests from Ubon, guests from Bangkok, guests from Malaysia, guests from Pitsanilok. So all of these people have faith in the Buddha, his teachings, his realization, and the community who practice. As well as faith, there needs to be generosity, dana, to want to come and participate in an offering ceremony. As well as faith and generosity, everybody here has a quality of loving kindness, metta, a desire to support the Sangha, to practice, you know, wishing that the monks have everything they need to uh, practice. Another quality present in all of those here would be that quality of Katanyu and Katavedi and gratitude. Most of us have very good Dhamma teachers, Krupa Ajahn, and we recognize that we've benefited from their teachings. Partly due to this, we want to support the Sangha so that future generations also have teachers and that they might benefit in the way that we have. And there's also quality of wisdom. We understand that in helping others, we're essentially helping ourselves. In helping others to have the opportunity to practice, we ourselves will have opportunities to practice in the future. Practicing generosity brings pleasant and helpful influences, experiences into our life. So it's a way of developing loving kindness for ourselves and uh, nourishing our own future in samsara, laying causes for future happiness and future opportunities. So tomorrow will be the official Katina ceremony. And tomorrow is also a day that we will formally offer this beautiful Buddha statue. And together the lay people then also formally offer the Dhamma Hall. Another group of people are offering some more land to be used as the forest around the monastery. And then we make the Katina robe offering and other requisites. So it's just reflecting a little earlier today about the fact of the arising of this Dhamma Hall and the manifestation of this beautiful Buddha statue. Back in just February of this year, this hill was covered in grass and there was no hall at all. And to have been able to build a large hall like this, 18 by 18 meters, and to finish it within six months, this actually required a very generous and concerted effort involving hundreds of human beings. One of the reasons I mention this is we're having what's called a katina samaki, a katina which is an opportunity for expressing harmony and cooperation. So in a way the katina is a day that we reaffirm these uh, qualities and these activities, but also that we're offering this Dharma Hall and this Buddha statue and just kind of recollecting the fact that the laity and the Sangha are already cooperating very beautifully. We had many people help 
uh, with uh, design, with material. Even the teams of workers uh, were willing to work very hard and fast to try to get it usable within four months so that we could use it during the rains retreat, which we did. And so there was a great deal of cooperation, a great deal of generosity, a great deal of effort expressed in the manifestation of this Dharma Hall. And now we have about 20 monks and maybe 80 lay people. We can all sit here comfortably, a nice breeze, mosquito screens. It's all very comfortable. So in terms of offerings, it's uh, very useful. And I'm sure we're all very grateful. The Buddha statue, as you can see, is made out of a very fine material. This is white marble from Italy. And it's also possibly the finest, certainly some of the finest craftsmanship in Thailand. The people who made it, people who've been carving stone statues for 20, 30 years, very talented craftspeople. So again, a lot of conditions coming together to allow this to manifest here. So the Katina is a time for demonstrating. The Buddha allowed a Katina offering and he, his intention, as far as I understand, was to allow the Sangha and the laity to come together and express their cooperation and their harmony and also to listen to teachings, particularly after a period of intensive retreat for the monks and nuns in the Buddha's time. It would be a good opportunity to encourage the lay people. And then the more practical aspect of it was that in the old days, living in forests in the wet season, many of the monks' robes would actually be kind of falling apart. If you couldn't get them dry enough, they, they actually rot. And so the Katina season, when the monsoon was over, was a time when lay people would offer the cloth and the monks could make themselves some new robes. The word Katina is actually the word for the wooden frame that the monks were allowed to assemble during the Katina season, which is one month. And it was a, a frame that a piece of cloth would be attached to in the middle. One monk would sit on the other side and one monk would sit on this side and then they'd send the needle through the cloth and they'd sew the cloth that way. And so that was a katina frame. We have this katina ceremony. Just talking about the conditions that give rise to things like Dharma halls and also Buddha statues, these are tools that we use to develop our mind in this training of dana and sila and bhavana. So we're talking about harmony and cooperation. We try to keep these buildings clean. That's a hallmark of the forest tradition, trying to keep the Sainasana nice and clean, nice and tidy. Tanajana Nan often says, we take care of the monastery and then the monastery takes care of us. If you take care of things on the outside, keep things in order on the outside, then things come into order, come together on the inside as well. And so this making of dana, producing of punya is a support for the purification of sila, the development of samadhi and the development of wisdom. And so that's why we actually use these buildings for recollecting the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, listening to wisdom teachings and then turning to training our mind, learning how to become more mindful, more calm, use that mindfulness and calm for contemplating in wise ways and developing wisdom. And so I, I think Thai people, Malaysian people, the dana barami, the generosity and the faith, is very strong in many people. And uh, thinking about harmony again, I'm talking about internal harmony now, in terms of those beautiful qualities that everybody here has. Uh, Tanajan Liam, my preceptor, when he gives dharma talks, he addresses the people who come as sadhu chon tang lai. It's like you excellent beings. And Tanajananan often talks about Kalyana Chon, Kalyana Chana in Pali, which means lovely beings or beautiful beings. So what they're talking about here is these beautiful qualities that you have of faith, of generosity, of loving harmony, of being able to cooperate. That makes you lovely beings. And, uh, once again, I welcome you. I'm glad you're all here and uh, we rejoice in your goodness. 
What we have to do though, of course, is refine this loveliness and refine this capacity to harmonize on the mental level. So a list that I often talk about is these five spiritual faculties and five spiritual powers, the faith, effort, mindfulness, concentration and wisdom. And the reason I want to mention it now is because Lord Buddha, after his big insight into dependent co-arising under the Bodhi tree in Bihar, India, more than 2,500 years ago, one thing that Lord Buddha saw when he reviewed the process of his enlightenment is that these five qualities, when cultivated, when they became powerful spiritual powers, merge in the deathless and lead in the deathless. So this is something very important and interesting to pay attention to because basically what Lord Buddha is saying is that these are conditions that lead to the unconditioned when they're in harmony. And so all of us here have strong faith and we do have effort, we do have energy and we're applying it in being generous, in offering service, in cooperating, in being harmonious. But in terms of refining that further, cultivating that further, we need to apply our effort more and more on the mental level, particularly at maintaining a good quality of mindfulness consistently. And then using that consistent mindfulness, the dana, the sila, and then the consistent mindfulness and the faith, that gives the mind some stability. And then you can train the mind in having more stability, more collectedness, when you have consistent mindfulness, more collectedness, more stability, you can contemplate in wise ways, developing insight and developing deeper wisdom. So these are five mental qualities, conditions that lead to the unconditioned. So I just want to encourage everybody, it's one of the things that monks do is remind laity, you've already got a lot of good things coming together, you've already got a lot of good qualities cultivated in previous lives. And then what we have to do is focus and refine that so that we apply our effort to the daily meditation, the daily chanting, listening to Dhamma talks, doing retreats. I would hope all of those who come and support practice monasteries have a daily meditation practice. And I would hope that we're thinking of increasing our practice. The older that we get, we actually try to do, instead of just one session of meditation a day, hopefully try to do two, morning and evening. And later on, if you, you're retired, you have less duties, you can do some meditation morning, afternoon and evening. I think that's something that is uh, worth aspiring towards. Taking your faith and taking your effort and applying it, giving rise to energy and training consistent mindfulness so that you can have more and more stability of mind and see things more wisely, especially as we get older and there's more illness, more pain. You want to have a quality of awareness that can separate out from that pain. In about eight days time, I'll be leading a group of students and some monks to go to India. And one of the things I asked everybody going on the trip was to be aware of the fact that we might die actually while on that pilgrimage. Although it's not that likely, we have a very good tour company and we're taking great care to travel at a sensible pace and take care of people's health. But we have to be aware of the fact that it's always possible. And especially as we get older, it's not just possible, it's inevitable. And it's becoming more and more inevitable. So as students of Lord Buddha, we contemplate upon this more and more so this is one of the things we do to sharpen our focus so that we can focus in our life and applying the faith and applying the energy in truly wise ways, giving rise to a samadhi and giving rise to wisdom. Katina is about coming together as a community. It's very important. I'm very happy today to have these monks here who are my generation and uh, Ajahn Maharisak has been a bhikkhu one year more than myself, Ajahn Dui two years more than myself, Ajahn Punya one year more than myself, Ajahn Den one year more than myself, and Ajahn Bum, we actually ordained in the same ceremony. And so 
One thing that Ajahn Liam says, which I think is very beautiful, my preceptor, he says in terms of spiritual practice, he says you need to have Sangha, you need to have community, we all need to have Kalyanamitta. And uh, Paul Liam says it's like if you have one big tall tree in a place where there's very strong winds, which is the world, the worldly winds of praise and blame and happiness and sadness, gain and loss, fame and ill repute, these strong winds that we're all subject to, that if you're exposed to those winds as one being, you can break, you lose the plot basically, you get reactive, your practice stumbles. He said, but if we are together, growing together is like a forest, you see. And so these monks, in a way, our seeds were all planted around the same time. And now we're all around 20 punters. It's a bit like a new forest that's come up and we are a source of support to one another, a community, encourage one another, support one another. But it's similar with the lay people. We welcome you. One of the reasons for building this Dhamma Hall is uh, the uh, five or six or seven monks that live here don't need a big Dhamma Hall. This Dhamma Hall is actually mostly for the laity. So you have a place here to come and meditate, which is a quiet place, a peaceful place, and we welcome you. Because you need to have your Kalyanamitta, you need to see your teachers, see examples of people who are practicing refined practice of sila, practicing samadhi, and in a way recharging the battery making that commitment again to practice more and more in your life. And if you do lose the plot, things fall apart, quickly come back to the monastery, see the monks, meditate, stay for a few days nearby, come and use the infrastructure. I mean, Thai people are very, very good at building monasteries. I don't think there's any other country where dana barami towards the sangha is this powerful. I think it's an incredible strength of the Thai people. And that's really great because it means you have places where you can go if things get difficult. We also find that in places where people keep seal and meditate daily, there's an energy that builds up in the very air in those places, which is different to the energy in a city where people aren't practicing refined restraint and aren't practicing patience. And there's a lot more kilesa, basically, a lot more greed and a lot more aversion, irritation, anger flying around literally in the air. You come on top of the mountain where people are trying to be restrained and circumspect, meditating, listening to Dhamma and keeping refined sila, then there's a coolness in the very air and almost a sense of spaciousness. Here also we have a very lovely sky, a sense of space. So you come and you meditate on top of the mountain in a place where other people meditate and you might find that you're able to let go of difficult mind states much more easily. You're able to see them. A mind state is just a mind state don't have to identify with them, don't have to grasp at them. And one of the ways that Tanajana Nano is talking a little bit about dependent co-arising, which has 12 factors. One of the ways Tanajana Nano often talks about that in an abbreviated form is avidya tanha upadan, as being the cause of suffering. So avidya is ignorance, tanha is craving, and upadana is attachment. And it's because we don't see things clearly as they are that we crave for and not for. If we saw things truly as they are, we wouldn't crave for them. And then we attach because of delusion as well. But when we apply the faith and the effort into developing the mindfulness, you begin to see things as they truly are. And you see a mind state is just a mind state. And it's amazing, if your mindfulness gets a bit weak and fuzzy, it's actually amazing how completely one can identify with thoughts and feelings in the heart, emotions. And you come on top of the mountain and you meditate a bit and you might wonder, why am I making so much out of this? I don't need to do that, why am I doing that? And Tanajan Cha often talking about putting things down, he uses the word bloy wang, bloy hymen wang, the training oneself to be able to put down the mind states. They're not I, not mine, not me. A mind state arises, stay for some time, due to conditions, and then it ceases. And if you have enough mindfulness, you can separate the awareness out from the mind state. Train yourself not to attach, because this is the cause of suffering. But when we're surrounded by other people who are doing the same thing in our lay life, very difficult to remember that. And so this is why we 
use the monasteries and we come and we see the monks or nuns who come and talk about your suffering and then the monks and the nuns might gently remind you develop a bit more mindfulness, train yourself not to identify with it, learn how to let go from it, especially in the formal sessions, not identifying with these things and becoming less reactive in your daily life. So I just wanted to talk a little bit. I know more than half the people in the room can't understand the word I'm saying, so I'm reluctant to talk for too long. But I did want to offer a few words in English to our special guest and as a word of encouragement and to thank everybody in a way also and rejoice in your kindness towards the Sangha at Anandakiri and thank also my friends, the Sangha who've come to support us in our Katina ceremony. So I'll offer these few words about uh, laying the foundation and giving rise to the causes that will lead to the deathless and lead to your own liberation and uh, offering a reflection about how this beautiful training in being generous and cooperative and harmonious on the outside is the beginning of a training, the foundation of a training in cultivating further those beautiful mental qualities that when harmonized lead in the deathless, merge in the deathless. So due to all of the beautiful merits that you beautiful people are cultivating, May you be supported in your spiritual practice. May you constantly meet with good teachers, good teachings, opportunities to practice. And may you practice until you realize complete cessation of every type of suffering.